British Airways say they may delay their flights as America's Skylab space station falls to Earth in the next 36 hours. Some countries say they'll stop all their flights as Skylab comes down, but the chances of it hitting anyone are said to be very remote. Tonight's check on the 85 tons of Skylab shows that the space lab's less than 120 miles up and will fall out of the sky late tomorrow or early on Wednesday. Skylab's next close approach to Britain will be at half past 11 tomorrow morning. It'll cross the Scillies and Guernsey. Our science editor Peter Fairley assesses the chances of anyone being hit by Skylab. If anyone sold you a hat to stop bits of Skylab falling on your head, and several thousand have been sold in America, you've probably wasted your money. The team of British scientists who've been tracking Skylab for ITN now predict it won't fall on Britain. There were fears that it might hit Cornwall, but its orbit now is taking it further south. But it will fall somewhere, because what goes up must come down. And according to the North American Air Defense Command, who are using computers to plot its descent second by second, 90% of the world's population, that's four billion people, are theoretically at risk. The dying moments of Skylab are expected to occur somewhere along a line 50 degrees either side of the equator. The 85-ton spaceship, the biggest thing ever put into space, will begin to disintegrate as it hits really thick air layers. The friction will build up until the whole thing has turned into a fireball. Two questions remain. What bits will reach the ground and survive re-entry, and will they hit anyone or anything? NASA tonight put the odds at 152 to 1 against, but nevertheless they've got lawyers standing by in case of mishaps and court claims. There are eight bits which may reach the ground. Six oxygen tanks weighing more than a tonne each and made of titanium. One lead-lined film vault weighing nearly two tonnes. And the biggest piece of all, the fixed airlock shroud, 22 feet long, made of aluminium and weighing two and a quarter tonnes. All these are likely to hit the Earth at 260 miles an hour. So what are the chances of it hitting land? Well, NASA has one card up its sleeve. The small manoeuvring engines aboard Skylab still have some fuel left in them. And in the final stages, if computers predict that the debris seems destined to land on populated regions, scientists at Houston will try to fire the whole lot together and push Skylab into an ocean. We won't know until the last two hours. Skylab was launched in 1973 to explore the problems of men living for long periods in space. It was occupied by three crews, nine men in all, the longest living aboard for 86 days, then a record which the Russians have subsequently beaten. The Americans hoped it would never come down at all. They planned to keep on raising it in orbit using the space shuttle as a kind of pushing vehicle, but they miscalculated. During the last three years, the sun has been unusually active, and the solar wind, which the sun puffs out, has forced Skylab down faster than gravity would normally do. And the shuttle, on which so much depended, has not even made its maiden flight yet. So there's an awful lot of tension and nail-biting going on in American space headquarters at this moment. Ending space station Skylab still has the experts guessing just when and where it'll fall to Earth. The latest reckoning is it'll come down at 5 o'clock tomorrow afternoon, somewhere over the South Atlantic, west of Africa. But they told us tonight we could be five hours out either way. What can be said for certain is that the 85 tons of Skylab will pass over Cornwall, right over the lizard head, at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. If it were coming down at that time, and we stress that's pretty unlikely, debris could theoretically be strewn over the entire shaded area of this map. But the American Space Agency say they're reasonably confident that if Skylab looks like heading for land, they'll fire its engines to delay the fall until it's safely over water. One spacecraft giving them no trouble is Voyager 2, sending back detailed pictures of Jupiter and four of its moons. These include Europa, the size of our own moon, never photographed in detail before. It's an ice-covered place, flat, with a lot of cracks. As Voyager 2 passed close to Jupiter itself, the turbulence around the mysterious big red spot seen by Voyager 1 four months ago has subsided. But there's no doubt it's a storm going on down there, covering an area three times the size of the Earth. 
Voyager has now left Jupiter on its way to Saturn. Good evening. The remains of Skylab crashed to Earth at about half past five this evening, and a sizable proportion of them landed in Australia. The 77-ton space laboratory flew further than the Americans had hoped, and tonight it began breaking up over Western Australia, the end of its six-year voyage through space. Skylab overshot the favoured landing place, the Indian Ocean. Throughout the afternoon, the Americans predicted, predicted it would fall into the sea, but from half past five our time, reports began to come in that pieces had been seen passing over at least four Australian towns. And as time went on, it seemed likely that much of the wreckage had fallen into the Australian desert 500 miles further on. Tonight, two West Australian wit eyewitnesses described to Gavin Hewitt what they'd seen as the Skylab wreckage passed over. As it went through the air, I saw a main body of trailing fire, which was trailing fire behind it. There was a main centre which was glowing red and green flames, and fairly large pieces uh, departing away from it, also burning up. How large did these pieces look? Oh, uh, <laughs> that'd be fairly hard to estimate. Uh, I would say the distance from where I saw it would be uh, at least 200 miles away, so I cannot give any estimates of, of, on the size. What actually happened was after it had passed about three or four, four minutes later, we got a series of uh, like sonic booms over the town, which was rather impressive. Uh, I think that was the most eer the eeriest part of the whole thing. The um, light, lights were rather spectacular, but the um, booms that followed, I suppose, were a little bit scary and eerie. Throughout the last few days, as Skylab's orbit dropped, America's National Aeronautics and Space Administration kept a minute-by-minute -minute check on the space station. Our Washington correspondent, Martin Bell, shared NASA's round-the-clock watch. The space agency in its control center here was ready to alert foreign governments, send out disaster relief teams, whatever was necessary. And in a tense and crowded NASA headquarters, as the moment of Skylab's re-entry approached, there was no knowing what would be necessary. No knowing either exactly when or where the spacecraft would re-enter. NASA's predictions had Skylab falling on a 4,000-mile path first across the Atlantic and then the South Indian Ocean. It was last tracked breaking up over Ascension Island, and from then on its 500 pieces should have splashed down safely at sea. But they didn't, leaving Skylab controller Richard Smith to answer questions like why were the predictions out and was he at least surprised? Yes, because I thought it was going to break up a little earlier than that and uh, probably would not reach Australia. Uh, it apparently flew longer than we expected, broke up at a slightly lower altitude, and we were surprised when we heard that there were sightings of Australia because our last prediction uh, that Nora had made uh, said it should have uh, come down uh, slightly before reaching Australia, and we were surprised when we got that input. Why do you think it took longer to break up than you expected? A lot of variables in the upper atmosphere and uh, a lot of variations in the vehicle strength. Uh, the fact that if it breaks up at a lower altitude uh, could uh, very uh, easily mean that the heat spike could have been greater. Uh, might have, uh, could have very probably indicate less pieces, less mass coming down. Uh, and would, would, would have also meant a smaller footprint if it came and broke up at a lower altitude. Are you satisfied? Can you be satisfied with the way this thing has ended? I won't be satisfied until I... Uh, wait two or three days and there's no report of any damage or injury anywhere, then I would be satisfied. Can we take it there'll be no more uh, Skylabs or spacecraft making random re-entries after this? There will be spacecraft making random entries after this. There's a lot flying today that will random re-enter. I question that a large uh, manned spacecraft such as this would be built in this fashion today because we would not build it this way because of the techniques are different. And NASA's message to the people of Australia? Well, uh, if you saw it, I hope the site was uh, spectacular, and uh, I hope no report of any damage or injuries anywhere. As you've been informed that we have had several sightings, reportings of sightings of, of uh, hot debris uh, overhead, or not necessarily overhead, but visible. Uh, some reports were up to 20 to 50 pieces. We've had no reports uh, of any uh, type, of any uh, uh, damage, concern, or anything of that nature. We've had no contacts, uh, uh, to my knowledge at this time, uh, uh, from the Australian government through state channels. Skylab's end illustrated from modern... Well, I don't know what you classify as a total success. Uh, we knew that we had a footprint of 4,000 miles in length. 
Uh, we knew we had very imprecise control. We knew there was no way we could assure that we control it and put it in water. And I'd say that it came in and parts of the world and on tracks that the least people involved. From that standpoint, I think uh, we were very fortunate. And, and uh, although we didn't control the, the exact orbit area of that thing, I think the actions we took kept it in very, very, on orbits of very, very low population density. I was surprised that breakup took as long as it did to occur. Uh, the last hour or so prediction looked like it would not get to Australia. But why did it take so long to break up, do you think? Do not know. Tougher satellite than you imagined. Yeah, we built them good. So Skylab reached the end, not quite in the manner predicted, refusing to splash tamely out at sea, instead writing a fiery last page of its history in the night skies of Australia. Roman Rees, News at 10 in Washington. The NASA said the town of Rolina say they found Skylab's docking cylinder, one of several claims made after the spacecraft broke up and crashed to Earth in the middle of the Australian night. Eyewitnesses compared it to a fireworks display with flashes of different colored lights followed by a series of loud sonic booms. Near one town, 20 small pieces of charcoal-like wreckage were found. Like all other claims, they'll now be flown to Perth for scientific checking. Most of the debris seems to have landed in open country, populated largely by Aborigines along with a few scattered sheep ranches. One ranch owner, Gordon Siler, watched with his family as Skylab broke up. Close to quarter to one or, or 12.45, the wife and I and my wife's mother were, woke up uh, with loud bangs, uh, which we thought instantly was uh, an earthquake. Uh, and it shook the entire house. Uh, we could actually feel the concussion of them in the air. Uh, we ran outside, and only when we got outside we realised what it was. Uh, and realised it was the sonic booms of the uh, of Skylab breaking up and going over. Uh, there was about three booms that were particularly loud, the loudest I've ever heard.